Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody to part three of our Creating Healthier Buildings webinar series, Elevating Building Disinfection. So with me today, I have special guests, Frank Santini. He's the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Building Business Development here at Pure Air Control Services, and Jeff Stone, who is our Building Remediation Sciences Director. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Troy. So Thanks, Troy. building on the previous two webinars that uh, we hope most of you attended, uh, we're going to sort of recap what our considerations for healthy buildings, uh, you know, how contaminants are transmitted via the indoor environment, and then we're going to get right into the environmental management, planning and data, uh, clearance, validation, testing, and then right into uh, how to elevate your building disinfection protocols uh, through various methods, disinfectants, uh, and taking a multi-level approach. So in our previous webinars, uh, we sort of like to consider uh, what makes a healthy building, uh, and we look at it sort of like a wheel, where the hub of the wheel uh, is testing and monitoring and understanding what your situation or baseline conditions are in your building. And then from there, we moved into uh, HVAC uh, and duct work, hygiene and restoration. And so today's piece of the puzzle and what it takes to create a healthier building, we're gonna be talking about building disinfection. So again, you've, you've seen this graphic in the previous webinars, and uh, today we're going to look at everything from the roof to the basement of a building and how to disinfect and decontaminate uh, for indoor pollutants and pathogens in all of those spaces. So we know that the CDC basically is holding the line on a spray and wipe down method of disinfection and are considering that good enough. And today, since we're talking about sort of taking that to the next level, uh, you know, we wanna sort of start with why, you know, why do you wanna go there? Why do you wanna be better than good enough? And especially uh, in a situation like we have with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, we figured that, you know, let's go and dive right into a real world scenario that we've recently completed and, and are possibly going to have some ongoing work here. And that was a large public venue that we just wrapped up uh, at the end of July. And this large public venue was actually used for a field hospital during the height of the pandemic in March, April, May. And the stakeholders, in conjunction with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers, needed to recommission this space back to public use or event use. And so when we met with this large group of stakeholders, they wanted assurance uh, at the environmental level, because it was being used as, as a clinical field hospital, that the disinfection and decontamination uh, that they were getting was going to be next level. They wanted that assurance. And so all told, uh, we were able to go in and use a multi-level approach that included the HVAC systems to disinfect around 2 million square feet. Now, Jeff Stone, our project manager and director of our BRS, or Building Remediation Sciences Division, he basically spearheaded this project. And I think that, uh, Jeff, you can tell us a little bit about what went into the planning, how we deployed, and uh, sort of what we did for this uh, very prestigious customer. Yes, um, uh, initially we had, we had gone up there just prior to this, and we did a, uh, an environmental cleaning of their HVAC, sorry, HVAC systems. Um, then we went back right after the COVID and they gave us a call. And what we did was we split up in two separate groups and we had uh, one team and they worked on the roof of the building and their primary objective was to uh, decontaminate all the rooftop air conditioning units. 
And then once they were done with that, they would go down below and work on the units within the building. So the basic process in which they uh, did their job was they went in, they went up to the roof every day. Obviously, they were all dressed up in their PPE. And we opened up the units and we did a, a HEPA vacuum of the units. And once all the units were HEPA vacuumed, we would use uh, an approved disinfectant and uh, an electrostatic spray guns, and we would disinfect the whole unit. We would take through the walls, the coil, the blow wheels, every part of that unit from top to bottom. Once we were done with that, we would move on to the next uh, next unit. Um, actually, let me backtrack, because we also did testing on these units to clear them. And we had done surface samples, and we, have done, we did swab samples on these units as well. So um, about how many units were there, Jeff? Approximately. About 70 units on the roof, 70 rooftop units. And then there's a handful of them within the building as well. Most of the units were on the roof, and the other ones were in the basement level. Um, this particular complex has four different levels and, and loading docks on the first level and the third level as well. So while we were going in and we were disinfecting expo halls, we were also disinfecting any of the interstitial areas. We were, we were going into any of the ladies' rooms, men's rooms, locker rooms, the office areas. Uh, this particular facility has uh, it has a, a food court. So we would go into the food court and we would do an environmental cleaning of the food court area. Now remember, this we have different products for different things and different surfaces that we clean. The products that we use when we're doing a terrazzo floor, the disinfectant will not be the same product that we use on a food surface special disinfectants for that area. Then we have different ways of cleaning and disinfecting the carpeting areas because you want to make sure that when you're cleaning the carpets and disinfecting them, you don't want to stain them. So there's always something different that we have to use depending upon what area of the building that we're in. Yeah, that's excellent. I mean, 2 million square feet of building decontamination and disinfection. And as you can see, uh, we're using every single device uh, method in our our arsenal to really address this problem from the roof to the basement to the loading docks and even to this uh, right hand of your screen most picture to the actual areas that were set up uh, and being used as hospital rooms to treat every patients. Escalator, I'm sorry, every escalator handle, every touchable surface. There are some surfaces you electrostatic spray, but then the ones that you seem to touch more than others, your touchable surfaces, Besides electrostatic, we're going in there and giving a good heavy hand wipe. So we're revisiting some of these areas a lot more than one time. Uh, we're doing floors, we're doing walls, we're doing ceilings. A any area that you can imagine, we were decontaminating and wiping it down. Yeah, so you can see that, that these kind of methods and protocols based uh, on an environmental background are, are going to go above and beyond just a, a regular topical cleaning or using a disinfectant uh, spray dwell wipe you know we're doing that too but we're also employing these other engineered solutions uh, to be sure that it's thorough and totally effective to return this building back to public use i mean folks are are anxious to be able to reopen for conventions conferences if you look at the nfl today uh, so sporting events and so this kind of uh, top-down approach with a solid background uh, in environmental studies and concerns, planning and management, is really what's needed to bring a lot of these types of facilities uh, back to public use and you know, yeah. from a risk management and safety perspective. So the next couple of slides, you know, we're not going to dwell uh, too far on. But as you can just see from what we covered at this large convention center, uh, we have to be cognizant that not only this virus, but other contaminants uh, can be spread a variety of ways throughout the indoor environment. So not just person to person or aerosolized uh, where they're in the actual ambient space uh, dropping onto surfaces. Uh, and this could be a virus, this could be bacteria, particulate, mold right but the hvac system uh because typically it's recirculating the air and not 100 exhausting it is also going to recirculate 
some of these contaminants within the indoor environment. And again, that is why we take such a thorough and methodical approach to doing what we do. Again, as demonstrated in that example, uh, when we look at the environmental management of this kind of pathogen, uh, a, a virus, right, SARS-CoV-2, uh, or again, any other kind of in, indoor contaminants, uh, especially that are a living or microbial type of contaminant, bacteria, mold, dust mites, uh, we're going to be looking at high-touch surfaces where the occupant might be using a keyboard, a door handle, and then touch their mouth or face, nose or eyes, and that could create some kind of allergic reaction in the case of, of mold or different types of allergens, or it could create a serious infection uh, should it be a virus or that person's immunocompromised. Then we also look from uh, outside from the high touch surfaces objects into the entire occupiable space. So as Jeff was referencing, you know, we're looking uh, at carpets, we're looking at under desks, we're looking at ceilings, uh, parts of this environment that maybe someone's not going to touch, but there might be enough other microbial constituents for certain kinds of microbes to grow or multiply. Again, I'm thinking mold, bacteria, uh, and as we just showed on the previous infographic, the HVAC system. So all of these uh, areas within a building should be under the microscope, so to speak, uh, for how contaminants can uh, transfer, be spread, and thrive within uh, a building. And as, of course, part one of this webinar series talked about, we looked very deeply at understanding those baseline environmental conditions and how a chain reaction can be set up if one area starts to go beyond an acceptable threshold where that can start to permeate into other areas of the indoor environment. And pretty soon you have a big problem on your hands. So, uh, you know, Jeff, you kind of alluded to this a little bit when talking about uh, that initial why and, and how we came to the table with this large convention center. Uh, but maybe Frank, you can sort of take us through, you know, the planning and the kind of data we need when we're going to attack a job and make sure that we have the right disinfectant product and method uh, for the job. Yeah, you know, each job is different. You know, the, the scenario that Jeff just described was a unique scenario. And a lot of scenarios are unique. Um, but in, in, in that particular situation, I wanted to mention in the, with the large venue that, that, that Jeff just described, um, that took the um, the brain power of you know our staff microbiologists, our staff aerobiologists, which is a, like a microbiologist for, uh, for airborne pathogens, um, and our industrial hygienists, along with our project managers, to come up with a a, a plan um, for that particular venue, given what they had just gone through. So uh, that was an example of you know taking the scenario, understanding what was needed by the client to achieve their goals, um, and putting uh, you know putting a lot of environmental expertise together to put together a plan that would would make the building safe um, and. and give them confidence they could reoccupy and, and begin to have conventions again. Um, you know, you also look at things like uh, what is the, the, the use of the building? Um, in this case, it was a public space, but is it, it, we were also talking about a school or a city hall or a manufacturing plant. Uh, the age and condition of the building, you know, what, are there any pre-existing conditions uh, the facility managers or maintenance managers of the building are aware of uh, that could play a part and how a particular situation is going to be addressed. Um, you know, total and situational square footage has played a part, particularly in the last seven months since COVID has become, um, you know, a, a big part of our lives because you see situations in which we're asked to come in on an emergency basis and disinfect um, particular areas of a facility where a person who is a, a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 had just occupied the day before. Um, so you have those kinds of situations where you want to identify what break rooms or what bathrooms, uh, what hallways, what offices were that particular person in. So a, a scope of work can be defined and also what HPC systems serve those areas that that person was in 
um, if, if you're looking at, at that piece of it too, which you should look at, uh, given what we know about uh, the, the airborne nature of this virus. Uh, and then of course, approximate number of occupants will play a large role, um, and that obviously is dictated by what kind of facility it is. So all these pieces of data are taken into consideration when trying to draft a, a plan of action uh, based on our experience uh, of doing this for, for 30 plus years. Yeah, that's great, Frank. And, you know, Jeff also was talking about this with, with our first example, and it's something that's pretty unique to us. Uh, and I'm sure other folks are doing it or standalone IHs are, are doing it, but we're able to provide uh, pre and post disinfection uh, validation via environmental uh, surface testing for the coronavirus. And that's a pretty uh, powerful thing uh, that you can put in your back pocket if you're a risk manager, infection control person at a hospital, uh, a, a you know school district that you want to provide assurances, again, that you're doing everything that's possible uh, to ensure the safety uh, and occupancy of your buildings. And so uh, again, this is, uh, primarily a surface swab sample, and that is taken pre and post disinfection. It's sent back to our environmental diagnostics laboratory. It's looking for the genetic material of the virus picked up off of a surface. Now, we can also, in a more sophisticated scenario, do this with a uh, bioaerosol type of test and test for it in the air. Uh, but either way, it all comes back and we run it through uh, the RTQ-PCR device and it looks for that genetic uh, fingerprint of the virus. So it's gonna show up as either present, positive, or absent, negative. And with this particular test, uh, provided that we get the samples in a timely manner, we can provide same day turnaround uh, if needed, which is, you know, especially uh, again in, in this age, of professional sports where they're needing to find out almost immediately if their locker room is safe, if if their training facilities are safe. Um, and so, you know, the same day turnaround is, is quite useful in those scenarios. So again, before we do the disinfectant uh, or decontamination, and then after as a level of insurance, uh, assurance. And so, you know, that brings us to the actual sort of what we're talking about and how pure air control services does it and the level that we do it at. And so uh, as we get into, you know, the decontamination of these spaces and the equipment we use, you know, first and foremost, uh, Jeff was sort of talking about this uh, a little bit and, uh, and I'll ask him to elaborate here, but we're, we're choosing disinfectants from list N uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency. And these are disinfectants for emerging pathogens. And so what that means is, is even seven months into this pandemic or so, there's still not been a lot of uh, peer-reviewed uh, study on any kind of new disinfectants or any disinfectants that are being made specifically for SARS-CoV-2. So what the EPA does is it tests the efficacy of the disinfectants on this list against harder to kill uh, organisms. And should they work on those, the EPA deems that they should also work for the COVID-19 virus, uh, which is SARS-CoV-2. And so the EPA is looking at the harder to kill organisms and the efficacy against those, and then we'll list them uh, as uh, you know, ready for emerging pathogens like this. Uh, again, you know, at the outset of this pandemic, there were serious questions and concerns uh, raised uh, because of the demand for such products and whether the supply chains were holding. Uh, from the get-go, Pure Air Control Services, we diversified our product lineup, uh, not only for those supply chain reasons, but because, again, we use different types of disinfectants from this list for different types of applications. And Jeff, I mean, maybe you want to chime in here on a more detailed level 
uh, to what you were talking about at the convention center? Well, the, the, the one thing that's important to know is, especially when you're doing a hand wipe down of certain surfaces, uh, touchable surfaces, that certain products have uh, different specific kill times. So you can't go in with product A, wipe down maybe uh, some of the buttons of an elevator, spray it down and then wipe it down right afterwards because if you don't give it enough uh, the designated kill time and you test for it afterwards, you can still have a positive test, positive result. So you have to follow the instructions specifically for certain products. Uh, some, some products that we use are meant for electrostatic spraying. Some products are used just for fogging, where you kind of use, where the machine uses compressed air, and what it does is it puts a dry mist in the air, and as that dry mist hovers, and it's usually a combination of hydrogen peroxide and liquid silver, it will get under every crack and crevice in the surface, um, uh, every crack and crevice of the surface while the occupant is out of the room. And then once it's, you know, and then once it goes past its designated time for the fogging, we will use a gas meter to check to see if the room is clear for us to go back in and get our equipment. Then we, like I said earlier, then we have other specific equipment that we use just for types of floors, different kinds of hard surfaces, and then poor surfaces. You have to use two different types of disinfectants for that. Then you have certain things that you can only use in kitchen areas on, uh, on food touchable surfaces. Okay. Yeah, one thing I'll mention too, Troy, is that it's, you know, we, we're covering a lot here and we have a very diverse audience. So um, you know, some of these concepts for some of our audience may be, may be already known or, or very basic, but uh, we also do a lot of um, you know, private webinars for, for individual clients so to dig more deep into these concepts. I just want to make that note that we're, we're, we're covering things on a general level today, uh, but we have oftentimes clients reach out to us directly to do, uh, do uh, private seminars for them as well. You know, that's a good point, and that kind of goes back to our planning and important data slide, right? So if, if there's anything that, that is you want more information on, or when we start to go down that path to look at the specific applications we would need for your situation, uh, yeah, we have no problem huddling up with all the stakeholders and, and creating customized sort of one-on-one -on -one presentations to sort of lay the scope of work down and answer all of the questions and come up with that sort of engineered custom solution. So uh, again, you know, we're showing this at a very high level and all of the things that go into our thought process and, and our process to create positive outcomes for our customers, for sure. Uh, you know, again, when we're talking about these different types of disinfectants and we were talking about what this list in means from the EPA or disinfectants for emerging pathogens, uh, this, this quick graphic just kind of shows you uh, the types of uh, microbials that are uh, most susceptible to disinfectants and most resistant to disinfectants. And uh, we've pretty much dealt with all of these different types of contaminants and pathogens that are on all of these lists in various situations over the years. And as you can see that the coronaviruses, they're, they're actually pretty similar to uh, you know, a cold or a flu type of virus. And without getting you know, too deep into biology 101, uh, they basically have a, a, a fatty lipid layer that is like coating the cell. And that layer of, of sort of fatty acid is very easy to break down when it's not within a host, with it, when it's on a surface, when it's floating in the air, uh, which is why hand washing is so effective. And the CDC has held firm on those recommendations because if it's in the environment, it's not. Uh, that hard to kill compared uh, to some of these other things like spores, uh, these rhinoviruses, uh, and even sort of mold that sort of falls right in the middle of this matrix. So uh, that's basically what we're talking about when we're talking about disinfectants for emerging pathogens. So when we start getting into our specific solutions, uh, you know, of course, we do uh, the full CDC topical wipe down. Uh, and, and actually, we, we probably even sort of do it at a little bit higher level or with more attention to detail because we're so environmentally focused. Um, but you know, this is the CDC recommended 
gold standard right now for basically pro proactive or routine uh, you know disinfection. And again, most uh, organizations and facilities, you know, this is instilled in their custodial or janitorial team to do this. They've you've probably upped your game. I'm I'm certain uh, to where you might have only done this, you know, once a day at the end of the day or you know biweekly. Uh, but now you're probably doing it a few times a day, you know, morning, noon, and night. Uh, in the case of schools or or folks in offices that are back and, and actively working. Uh, but, you know, why don't you take us through, Jeff, a little bit about how we do this and, and what we're looking at when we go through. Uh, I would guys go through, uh, sorry, I would guys go through um, um, a lot of training before we go out into the field. We, we Our IAQ technicians, we learn pretty much not just to do this or to do that, but why we're doing what we're doing. Each each uh, each um, piece of equipment that we have takes a certain way to operate it. You can't you can't take an electrostatic gun and just spray it in one direction and call it a day. You have to know exactly how how the electrostatic gun actually works, how it's going to cling to the surface, how which way go how to go back and forth, and how to get maximum coverage on that surface. And, that, and that's what's important uh, as far as uh, what our guys do out in the field. Um, yeah, you know, another thing I'll mention too, Jeff, is that um, you know, oftentimes with these projects, although every time, but oftentimes we'll have a not only our project manager on site, but also a hygienist on site uh, with a fine tooth comb picking picking on the, the technicians, making sure they're not missing anything. So that's what we take the, these uh, you know the work we do very seriously in terms of um, triple checking uh, internally uh, the QAQC. Correct. During the QAQC, if we see that one of the technicians is doing something wrong, we will explain to them what they're doing wrong and why they're doing it wrong. That way they know exactly the proper way of doing it. So yes, I definitely, definitely do agree, Frank. Yeah, so I, th I think this, I think it's safe to say that that our audience today, you know, they, they understand this method uh, and that, you know, we're going to go above and beyond with our own QAQC to make sure that it's as effective as possible. Uh, but again, this method is basically focused on high touch surfaces. So you're you're going around just like you might even clean your own house. You're gonna clean the counters, you're gonna clean everything and then be done with it. But I think the next step, you know, that we're looking at here and, and where we really start to elevate uh, the efficacy of what we do, um, how, uh, cost effective it is and how agile or mobile it is, how, how much ground we can cover with this electrostatic spray. And I know that there's been a lot of this in the media lately and there's a lot of different types of electrostatic spray devices out there. But basically for, for the uninitiated who, or who don't really know, uh, as Jeff was saying earlier, you know, it uses an air compressor that puts the, the liquid through and atomizes it uh, at the wand or gun tip, right? And then it charges uh, these particles of disinfectant uh, with a positive charge. And so not only uh, does this positive charge attract it to the surfaces, it also sort of kind of keeps them clumped you know, together so they're a little bit larger cluster of particles. And so just like if you would take uh, the old, you know, magic trick you rub a balloon on your head with the static electricity and stick it to a wall and it just hangs there right well that's the same thing that's happening uh, with this electrostatic process these ions uh, these these particles are charged and they begin to wrap around behind and under surfaces and in the cracks and the crevices and it puts this disinfectant in places that you can't even reach with a, a hand pump sprayer or by wiping it with a rag. And so as this electrostatic spray permeates everything, uh, it's gonna have its own sort of dwell times depending on the type of disinfectant and the load of the disinfectant, how much is being sprayed or misted in the room. But basically it, it makes it so that each surface is evenly coated uh, with this directional spray as it's being directed and as jeff said 
our technicians are highly trained on how to use the various electrostatic spray devices that we have, and they know uh, the distance to stand from a surface, how long to keep the spray going, what motion to use when they're actually spraying. So it's not just walking around and spraying, that there is a, a planning that's involved to this and how we attack a certain surface, a certain area within a building. Troy, so actually you were there for that. We actually used uh, thermal imaging. Use. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we, used, we used thermal imaging to find out the correct way in which to use the electrostatic spray gun so you have maximum coverage on that surface. So we have to go beyond the normal just to find out the correct way to do things. Oh, that training is, is paramount here at Pure right. Control Services. So as I was saying, another one of, in one of the main uh, disinfectants we use in the electrostatic spray guns uh, is a combination of hydrogen peroxide and silver. So this gives just a, a glimpse into how some of these uh, disinfectants work. And, and that is that the hydrogen and peroxide uh, and silver, it damages that outside layer of the cell. And it's, it allows that, that uh, silver to, to basically penetrate the envelope or the outside layer, and then next it binds to that genetic material uh, that is uh, what makes you know SARS-CoV-2 in this case so infectious, and it basically incapacitates it, or you know basically inactivates it by uh, incapacitating the cell's enzymes or the energy source uh, that makes, in this case, SARS-CoV-2 replicate. But in, in other cases, again, it might be bacteria, it might be mold, or other types of viruses uh, that this works on. And again, there's other disinfectants that we use depending, again, on the application. This one seems to be predominantly used for uh, our electrostatic spray guns. So when we get into the different methods that we're employing for electrostatic spray, and I think you, you saw some of that in the earlier pictures uh, from the job site, uh, but it comes down to basically, you know, two, you know, main devices uh, that we're using for the electrostatic spray, and that is one that's a handheld uh, gun or wand, and then we also have uh, more robust room foggers that is basically set it and forget it, come back, make sure it's safe, and take it out. If I can right jump here, in, our pure decon um, handheld. Sorry, if I could jump in here quick. The electrostatic spraying is actually different from the fogging. It's slightly different. The fogging is what uses the compressed air and creates that that fog, that cold, that cold, the uh, how do I say, it? the cool mist in the room where it just hangs there like a slow fog. Where the electrostatic spraying is more directional. If you're looking for a surface, you spray that surface. You go in there and you spray it, and like you said, it goes around, it wraps around that surface and clings to it. That's definitely more directional. But with the liquid silver, that's done through the fogging. Gotcha. Yeah, and so, and, and that's just what Jeff said. This is a, a highly agile and tactical method. We can move from location to location very quickly. Uh, you know, many times we might have two or three of this these devices uh, with our crew, with two or three technicians that are working different areas at the same time. Of course, in full PPE, uh, you know, so gloves, respirators, uh, the full Tyvek suits, uh, and and goggles, and so they're able to move through and very quickly, uh, you know, get at all of these surfaces uh, in a very tactical, strategic way. Um, again, it's focused on high touch surfaces. Again, I don't mind me jumping in. When we do go to a, a specific job site, we create a donning and a doffing station, which is an area in which you want to take your PPE and put it on and then take it off because the last thing you want to do while you're cleaning is cross-contaminating what you just cleaned. So you always have to create that one station and that donning and doffing station is also under negative pressure. Right, so, so it's, it's, it's under containment and it has an air scrubber, if, if, is that right? Absolutely, yes, that is correct. So yeah, so what Jeff's alluding to, it's, it's almost like if you've seen the movie E.T., uh, but there's there's a containment tent that we build for our technicians uh, on these, these job sites. And that's put under negative pressure that uh, anything that's in that containment area is uh, basically brought into 
a, a negative air machine that is HEPA filtered and it scrubs the air. So is they're uh, either putting on their, their, their gear or taking it off, uh, any loose particles, anything that might be on uh, their person is then kept in that contained area. Uh, so that, that's a very good point, Jeff, uh, that goes in with our training and, and then, you know, again, the next level stuff that we're doing to ensure that, uh, you know, we're not making the problem worse or, or what have you. So, you know, again, and then I think the other thing that, that we'd want to mention about these disinfectants that we're using and, and uh, especially in these electrostatic spray guns is that uh, they basically uh, degrade uh, into, you know, uh, a safe level of, of uh, operation, right? So there's no harmful byproducts after use. If, if you've seen uh, any of these devices in action, or if you, if you would sort of, uh, you know, observe how we're doing the work, when we're done spraying and we walk out of the room, there, there's, there's no residue uh, of any of this disinfectant left on any of these surfaces. Uh, because of the way that it works, because it's a fine atomized mist, uh, it's, it's not really what you would call wet at all, where it's, it's runny or residue. And we spray our offices uh, with this very device pictured here. We, we spray our offices since the beginning of the pandemic, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. And I can even tell you, I come in sometimes maybe just a half hour after they've gone through the building, everything is dry, there's no residue. Uh, I've never been affected, uh, you know, by this. So uh, really, truly, there's no harmful byproducts after use, uh, and you don't really have to worry about certain things, uh, you know, being affected, you know, computer equipment, uh, phones, you know, uh, of this nature. Uh, again, and then moving from the handheld devices, this is what Jeff was talking about, where this actually, and I know a lot of industrial hygienists don't like to use the term fog, uh, for whatever connotation that it might have. Uh, but this is where we have a device that can mist or literally fog the entire room. And, and you know, Jeff was talking about that. Now, in this case, uh, you know, we're, we're going to look at maybe a little bit higher level of containment for these types of scenarios, Jeff? Correct. When, when you're doing the electrostatic spraying or performing that, that uh, service, you can be in the room in your PPE, but when we do the fogging of the room, we are not in the room. Uh, if we're fogging a certain area of the building, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go in there, we're gonna seal off the supply and the return grills. Once we, once we seal the whole room off, then we're gonna go in there and we're gonna measure the cubic feet of the room. And based on the cubic footage, now we know exactly how long and for what period of time we can fog the room for. Once we start the machine and we, we leave the room, we will tape the door off so nothing escapes and we wait for the machine to, uh, to do what it needs to do. And then uh, once it's done fogging, we give it about an hour and a half, and we pull a piece of tape back, and we go under the door with our gas meter to, to see if it's safe for the technician to go back in wearing his PPE still to pull the machine out. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Again, safety is the utmost concern for, for not only your occupants, uh, but for our technicians as well, you know, we, we want the job to be done right and it to be effective. Um, hey, Troy, I'll moving mention something. from these occupiable spaces, high touch surfaces, fogging an entire room, we can also use uh, specific kinds of uh, these list in uh, EPA registered disinfectants for emerging pathogens inside of the ductwork and uh, the HVAC system. Is that correct? Yeah, Frank, you want to jump in, Frank? Yeah, so just to mention the, the whole room disinfection for a moment, the, uh, you know, we, we're thinking about COVID, obviously, but we've been, you, we've been doing that for a number of years, Jeff, and uh, I just wanted you to, to mention, you, if you could mention the audience, where else, we, where else we've used whole room disinfection in the past for. We've been doing this for at least the past 10 years, and we do this when we have, um, a lot of times we have a project and we have to do some mold remediation. For whatever reasons, there's, there's stuff going on in the walls of the building, and they're having an issue with that. So once we do the, uh, the remedial work, before we have we break down the containment, we have to disinfect and do a total wipe down of the room. And what better way is to use our pure decon method? Gotcha. Yeah, another thing that, that, that if you use the hydrogen peroxide silver uh, formula, um, when we looked 
a few slides ago about the spectrum of what, what can be killed with different disinfectants. All the way on the right, as you look at the screen, was uh, the bacteria called C. diff. This is a very yes. difficult bacteria, notorious in the hospital settings. Um, and, the, and the hydrogen peroxide silver formula is 99.9999. So four, four levels of nines beyond 99 effective against, uh, against C. diff. So it, and that's one of the most difficult things to kill in terms of pathogens. So uh, it's used in operating rooms uh, because of that and other, other areas. So um, just to make the point that we're talking about COVID here, but when you use uh, that type of like for example, hydrogen peroxide silver formula, you're, you're, you can destroy pathogens uh, way more difficult to kill than COVID, and you don't have the uh, the difficulty like you have with uh, bleach or quaternary ammonium that um, you know can produce respiratory symptoms in, in some folks um, as a residual. So you have a lot of benefits from that particular type of disinfectant um, um, in, the, in the context of COVID and other pathogens. Excellent. Yeah, so, so moving from a, a full room fogging, uh, again, we can use uh, these specifically, uh, you know, different types of uh, disinfectants inside of the HVAC system uh, as well. And I know in our last webinar, we talked pretty thoroughly about cleaning ductwork uh, in sort of, you know, some traditional ways. And we touched upon this a little bit and same with the air handler units. But uh, again, we have uh, full containment when we start to look at the ductwork where we're going to contain the, the areas of the duct that we're going to be working on. And then we move, you know, uh, sections by sections and continually move that containment as we work the whole uh, length of the ductwork. Um, and again, we can use some of the very same handheld devices if we have good access to the ductwork. And then we could also port it in where we would create our own access and maybe we're not going in and looking inside of it or getting uh, a, a part of our body into it or a hand in it, but we might just port it in with the hose and, and fog or mist that run of duct work, um, uh, you know, and then move it and, you know, and patch it up and go down to the next run. Uh, of course, uh, we can also do the supply and return plenums in the air handler unit. Uh, and then, of course, we can also bring this, in fact, this is sort of the device seen in this picture is what I was just describing, where we can cut a small hole in the duct run and then hook a hose up to it and mist that run of duct and then patch it up and move down and do the next run. Uh, but we can also use that as a handheld device as well. I'd like to add something also here, Frank. Yeah. In the picture that you see here, one of our technicians, she's actually um, spraying HEPA filters. Now, the reason that he was spraying the HEPA filters is when we initially went into this convention center field hospital, during the cleaning process, you have to remove anything that might be infected within that air hammer and replace it with something new once you're done cleaning it. But you can't remove it until you disinfect it. So we go in there and we disinfect the HEPA filters and individually bag them up and then have them removed. And then we clean the unit disinfectant and then we will put new filters back in there. So sometimes when you have to break materials down or remove things from the building, you also have to disinfect it and clean it before it leaves. Yeah, that's a great point that, that uh, some of our folks in the audience might not be considering uh, when they're doing this kind of maintenance within an air handling unit or uh, you know, so I think that's a great point that, that if you knew you were COVID positive as a building, uh, and in, again, in this case, it was actually a hospital, right, for all intents and purposes, that, yeah, you don't even want to touch these things until you know they're disinfected as a way to help, you know, provide that assurance when disposing of them. And you're having to do this before you even get into actually disinfecting the AHU at a higher level. So that, that's a great point and something I didn't even really think about, to be honest. So thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, but, well. you know, as you can see, you know, we're, we're looking at this uh, methodically from a top-down level. Uh, and again, as, as I said at the beginning, we're working from the roof all the way to the basement with these different uh, methods 
uh, and different disinfectants and different equipment to be able to address the situation. So again, when talking about this electrostatic spray, uh, and, and, and we're using you know commercial grade equipment that in some cases you know we've modified uh, based on our knowledge and training uh, to perform this work. So you know we're not going to Home Depot and just getting a pump sprayer or getting uh, an insect backyard fogger, right? And filling it with this disinfectant and running around our office or or your school. We're, we're using professional commercial grade equipment uh, that we've been trained on how to use, how to fix in some cases, because it's equipment, it breaks down. Uh, and so you would have that assurance when you're taking it to the next level that you're getting the, the right equipment for the right job. So again, we're not new to this game. We've been doing it, like Jeff said, for probably over 10 years, 15 years, uh, and have, have developed and perfected these methods uh, as we've gone along. So we're not, uh, you know, uh, an insect, uh, you know, uh, pest control company that's coming in to deal with microbial issues in a building. We're not new to the game and just going through and, and spraying everything you know, or a carpet cleaning company that decides they're gonna all of a sudden clean offices and cafeterias and uh, schools and, and such. So we're an environmental company, first and foremost, that has developed these procedures. And so as such, uh, we look at the efficacy of this ourselves, uh, you know, uh, on a regular basis to make sure the equipment that we have is performing uh, at spec and to make sure we have the best equipment for the job. So we did our own, in, in uh, internal studies in conjunction with our building sciences division where we did a typical wipe down as recommended and we filmed the whole process with a infrared camera a thermal uh, camera and so as you can see on the left that is what the camera picked up based on all of the areas that were wiped down in this office cubicle on the left or on the right, I should say, where it says electrostatic spray disinfection method, that was the results of the coverage based on the electrostatic spray device. So as you can see, the most coverage in these pictures is, is going to be the blacks and, and indigos and purples, and the least amount of coverage all the way down to that yellow, which is the ambient temperature of this cubicle, uh, is, is no coverage at all basically so and you know what in the area that gave us the most coverage also took the least amount of time to do it also that's correct and uh -huh. and, and the other thing i think that there is to note on some of this is that if you look at that cubicle now this was taken you know with a an infrared camera it's it's not high res like a digital camera or even your phone so it's not not the greatest picture there in the middle but if you look behind those computer monitors that is a, a, a cubicle partition that's cloth. So it's basically probably a polyester cloth that has some pill to it. And uh, you, you couldn't even begin to wipe that down uh, with, with a rag without it pilling up and, and creating all kinds of headaches. With the electrostatic spray, uh, the handheld device, you're able to, to mist across all of this and that spray attracts itself into every single uh you know weave of that fabric and then rests and and does its job so it, you know pretty remarkable stuff uh with the electrostatic spray as far as coverage efficacy and of course like jeff just said it actually takes less time uh to go through and and do it uh one of the things that we touched upon in the last uh webinar about our steam cleaning is that of course we have a variety of different kinds of uh, steam cleaning devices depending on the size of the unit where the unit's located etc but we also have what we call our light duty steamer or our dry steamer and we're seeing this pickup use in this COVID-19 pandemic because again it's a dry steam it's not super uh, wet where it's putting a lot of extra water or you know high pressure in there but it's putting the temperature uh up and against the surfaces and so maybe you know jeff you can kind of explain this a little bit better but we don't even have to just use this on coils right we can use this in a variety of situations 
Sorry. Actually, just as you were explaining with the partition walls where you can't just begin to wipe it down. In the past, we have used the steamer because don't forget the steamer has different types of attachments for different types of applications. And we can use these on cloth surfaces, whether it's a cloth chair or like you said, it's a partition wall. So um, definitely this, this uh, particular piece of equipment comes in handy. It doesn't put out a lot of water. It is a, it is a drier steamer. We can use them on smaller hotel units with thinner coils because for something like uh, for a smaller unit like that, you don't want to bring in anything heavy duty in industrial that's going to create a lot of water. Because if you do that, you might start to you might have some type of flooding, and you're going to cause issues that you're trying to solve. So you don't you know you don't want to go around in a circle. So it's all about using the right piece of equipment for the right job. Right and here, you can see we're we're doing it on. Uh, what appears to be a, a brand new system. So the, the coils are likely not that impacted or clogged, but you want to get the disinfecting, uh, you know, qualities from the high temperature steam to be able to, to disinfect in between these evaporator coil fins. So it's pretty cool. So basically, and, and we're wrapping up here. Uh, so we appreciate everybody hanging in with us. But basically what we're talking about from, from top to bottom is a multi-level approach to this kind of building disinfection and decontamination. So, you know, it can range uh, from a, a very, uh, you know, tactical type of electrostatic spraying of just the high touch surface areas, just the registers and grills for the HVAC equipment. And it can work its way up all the way to what we would call maybe a level five, right? Which would include all of these different levels. So they all compound on one another and, and build upon one another uh, until you have basically the most thorough uh, type of disinfection or decontamination service on the market today uh, with combining all of these different levels that we just talked about in the presentation. And so, of course, there's not a one size fits all type of scenario. We need to plan, we need to get the important data, we need to know what your situation is to be able to structure uh, this kind of service to make sure that your outcome is positive. And so as, as Frank alluded to earlier with, with the C. diff uh, example, and, and we have been talking about other examples, you know, and I'll quickly go through this because I know we're up against time. And we want to maybe get some questions answered here. But, you know, this isn't just for COVID-19. And some someday here and hopefully sooner than later, we'll be out of the woods on this COVID-19 pandemic. But this is an ongoing scenario for facility managers, building owners, uh, risk managers. And it, it can be a variety of indoor contaminants that you would need uh, one or more of these types of decontamination services for. So, you know, really quickly, this was a scenario that was at a university. And in fact, it was in their college of nursing and they had had uh, some water intrusion. Uh, they had a positive mold case in the interstitial walls and in this building, and they had it fully remediated. Uh, we did not do this work originally, uh, but their industrial hygienist came in, they cleared it. They said, no more mold. They tested for mold, the type of mold that was there, and they found no uh, living mold in this building after they remediated it. So it was below detectable levels for mold. Well, the staff, their symptoms and their complaints continued. And it was the same scenario that when they actually did find mold, but now they're not finding mold, right? And so this case study looks at how every aspect of the Pure Air Control Services team aligned, all of our divisions came together to find and solve this problem, right? So we even went in, we got called in as the, the environmental company, hey, we had mold, these people are still complaining, we want the second opinion, we want you guys to be the second opinion doctor. And so we came in, we looked, tested for mold, didn't find mold, right? But the staff were still complaining. They still had these symptoms. So our team got together. We met. We met with the stakeholders at the university, and we said, "Well, look, what happens if if you have a bad uh, infiltration of mold within, you know, this building? What could happen? Well, the mold could create spores, and then the spores from this mold 
uh, could fan out into other areas of this building. A byproduct of these spores is, is a chemical toxin. It's not a living organism. It's a chemical and it's called mycotoxin. So basically, we brought our teams together. We found that there was a lot of mycotoxin in this building. And we did this again by doing bioaerosol studies of the air in the various areas where there was a complaint. So we got these, these uh, bioaerosol samples back. We studied them. We said, there, there's a definite problem. It's mycotoxin. And we have to create a certain decontamination protocol to basically neutralize this chemical so it doesn't affect people anymore. There's a URL at the bottom of this. Incidentally, this uh, slide deck is a handout today in the webinar, so you can download a PDF of it. And so basically what we did is we mobilized not only our building sciences team, but our laboratory who went up to this university, set up a mobile laboratory situation, right? We looked at the vacuum cleaners that their housekeeping uh, was doing, their, their in-house custodial was doing, and they were just normal, uh, semi-professional grade vacuums. There was no HEPA filtration on them. And so what was happening is unbeknownst to them, they were actually spreading these chemicals through the building. And so as you see here, we have Francisco Aguirre, the director of our building sciences division, uh, taking particle samples out of one of their vacuum cleaners that had been used day in and day out uh, to see the particles that were being emitted and also found that there was mycotoxin in these vacuum cleaners. Then you see Dr. Sahai, who uh, has been on previous webinars with us. Uh, he set up his mobile lab. And then as we remediated this situation, uh, as you see over here with one of our HEPA vacuums that we use uh, for this kind of situation, and we also had to create a special solution that was tannic acid based to be able to uh, neutralize this mycotoxin without harming the carpet uh, or the you know occupants of the building and so with every room every area that we treated and cleaned uh, our building sciences and, and environmental diagnost diagnostics laboratory would take samples analyze them on the spot and if mycotoxin was still found we did the remediation process over until it cleared and there was no mycotoxin uh, in the building. So again, it shows you that, that while COVID is, is a tough situation that we're dealing with, buildings deal with these kind of situations every day. And there's never a, a one size fits all solution. And that's why you, know, you would want to turn to someone uh, who has the environmental expertise and past performance to solve these issues. And so again, we've been around since 84. We have these three specialized divisions. We basically work in all commercial types of buildings from, from class A office buildings, manufacturing, to education, government, healthcare facilities, you name it, we've been there. And as Jeff said numerous times through the presentation, all of our technicians, our laboratory, our industrial hygienists go through stringent training and recertification through all of the governing bodies that would, would take care of, uh, you know, making sure we're doing things at the level that we need to do them at. So again, we're right up against our hour. We did get a little bit late of a start. Uh, I do thank you for hanging in there and, and we'll take any kind of questions that you might have uh, in the question box or via uh, the chat. So, I have one question, it's from Mark Edwards. So thank you for the question, Mark. And he says that we are having problems with the disinfectants entering porous materials like polycarbonate, wood, stained woods, and stone. Uh, and over time, it's making them brittle or breaking down the stains He's, uh, of the wood. So he says, do you recommend, uh, or what do you recommend for disinfecting that would not do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Jeff, I'm not sure if you have any comments on that, but that's something um, we'd like to have one of our, uh, probably one of our microbiologists reach out to Mark directly uh, to answer that, because I want to make sure he gets an accurate answer. But um, it, is, it is bring up a, an overall um, issue that we shouldn't forget as we think about building disinfection is that 
uh, and this has been talked about by some scientists and doctors across the world, uh, what point are you using too much disinfectant? Um, not only from a short-term perspective of, of VOCs and chemicals that can harm and cause respiratory symptoms, but also from this perspective uh, as in terms of um, how does the disinfectant react to the type of surface you're spraying it on to even long-term issues in terms of um, uh, you know pathogen resistance um, and, immune, and, and, and uh, effects on your immune system. So um, it's a good question to think about the, the philosophical question overall in terms of the way we're using disinfectants, but uh, we'll, we'll make a note, Mark, to get back to you and have one of our scientists reach out to you directly. Yeah, absolutely. That was a good answer, Frank. I, I think that about covered it. Uh, we also have a question from Tim Thorson, and I think, Jeff, you, you're probably best to field this, and he says, I might have missed it earlier, but are you fogging the room with the HVAC system on or off? Um, well, the HVA system can run, but what we do is we seal off. When we're fogging the room, we're using a certain type of disinfectant that we don't want to get into the HVAC system. That will be a different product. So when we first go into the specific area that we want to decontaminate, we will seal off the supply and the return ducts, and then we'll do our fogging. When we go and clean the HVAC system and we clean the ductwork and we spray the ductwork down, that's a different type of uh, product that we use. Yeah, excellent. I know there's a lot of information here today, guys, uh, and, and it can be confusing. As Frank said earlier, we're happy uh, to schedule calls one-on-one -on -one or, or with your organization and stakeholders to go over very specific questions or scenarios that you might have. Uh, you know, some of these webinars could be turned into you know half a day classes if, if we really wanted to go deep into how some of this stuff works and really confuse you but but yeah that was a good question um i have another question coming in right now thank you carl nash he's asking uh we have a lot of steel parts that can rust with uh, a spray disinfectant uh, what are what are the recommended uses uh for these steel parts that's a good question. Jeff, do you have any comments on that? Or should we should we have one of the uh, lab laboratory scientists get back to it? We would go, I, I would get together with one of the lab people to field some of these questions. That way we can review our products and find out exactly which ones we can recommend to them. Yeah, again, can, I, I, I think that you're all. looking at possibly over disinfection uh, protocols sometimes, probably leaving it on too long or not being thorough uh, in your wiping process. I mean, those would be the top three things I would look at just off of the bat. But yes, this list in of registered uh, disinfectants at the EPA is actually a pretty long list if you haven't gone out there and looked at it yourself. And again, that's one of those kind of planning and important data uh, situations that we talked about at the beginning where we're gonna have to know what kind of facility you have, what kind of equipment you have in that facility. And then we might have to look at a different type of disinfectant, you know, based on uh, your scenario. So in this case where there's maybe a lot of, uh, you know, steel components, maybe it's stainless steel or, or, you know, high temp steel or chrome moly in a manufacturing situation. So you're absolutely right. There might be types of disinfectants that their chemical makeup would react with those metallic surfaces in a way that would be detrimental to them. And I, I think that, uh, you know, we can certainly sort of come back and field that question uh, to our laboratory team, or we might want to hear just a little bit more about your scenario. So uh, as we follow up after this webinar, uh, you know, uh, Carl, you know, maybe we'll take a look at your situation and, and, and do a sidebar and, and huddle up on your exact situation. Um, I have another question from Damien DeRocha, and he is asking, uh, have we ever <laughs> done uh, any kind of disinfection for hepatitis A? That's what I'm aware of. Yeah, that's a good one. We've been doing this for 36 years, so I wouldn't be surprised if we did, but um, <laughs> I hate to keep uh, 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 pushing the question off on our lab people. We'll I'll have to reach out to our um, to our, our building science team and uh, get an answer to that. But Yeah, um, Damien, we'll yeah. definitely get an answer to your question. 
as as we're familiar with, even in Florida where we're headquartered, you know, obviously we're one of the hospitality uh, capitals of the world, and and we've seen our share of hepatitis A outbreaks in restaurants and such. So we'd have to look at some of our past performance, and then we'll talk with our building sciences and lab team to get that answer for you. Well, I think that's about it. I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. That's been, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in, but that's been a good uh, lot of questions. I, I must say, those were some thoughtful and insightful questions. So again, for those of you who have hung in there all the way to the end, there's gonna be a short survey afterwards. Be sure to look at the tab on your GoToWebinar to look for handouts. So we, we do have our Healthy uh, Buildings program uh, brochure and our pure decon cut sheet as well as this entire slide deck as handouts and you will all be notified uh, after uh, the presentation today uh, on how to review this presentation or share it with colleagues and other stakeholders in your organization uh, those who couldn't make it today and don't forget that uh, on October 13th the final installment of our four-part uh, webinar series here will conclude with bipolar ionization, uh, in-room HEPA air filtration, and ongoing IAQ monitoring to create a self-healing building. So uh, again, on behalf of my guests today, Frank and Jeff, I thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, our contact information is right here. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. Again, thank you.